I wasn't paying attention. Has it been five minutes? Okay. All right. Uh, I'd like to start because title datums, we have maybe 30 minutes left. Ellen, I want to preface it by saying that contrary to what Laura thought, <laughs> I don't really work with title datums. So everybody here probably knows more than I do about title datums, and I'm hesitant to even tackle this, but I'll do my best. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll learn something. So um, again, uh, I'm, a, I'm a slide stealer. So, oops. <laughs> OK. I have to switch to the other, which I could have been doing. All right, so I stole many of these slides from that um, title datum workshop that I pointed out um, that had been done last year. And in the interest of time, I don't necessarily want to go into a lot of detail. As I said, I, I think probably, probably everybody here knows um, more than I about this. Um, but in case not, um, just a, a screen capture of um, the types of uh, sensors and equipment that are established or put out to uh, collect uh, water level data. And the, um, the um, relationship of that data to benchmarks on land to ascertain uh, what the datums will be eventually. And so there are two steps. There's collecting the actual water level data and then to calculate the tidal datums relating that to your station datum and or benchmarks on land. There are several different types of tides. Um, on the west coast, we have a mixed semi-diurnal tide. And that is a combination of these two uh, types of graphs showing uh, typical tides, semi-diurnal being two daily highs and lows, mixed meaning that those highs and lows are not at the same range, not at the same uh, water level. So what causes tides? Astronomic forces, planetary forces, the sun, primarily the moon uh, in this case, and those relative positions of those astronomic bodies relative to the Earth and where they are in their orbits, in each of, of their orbits. So there are variations that occur um, because of, of uh, the rotations of the, the moon and the ranges, the amplitude, are impacted by the, um, the phases of the moon, um, leading to smaller or greater uh, range of the tides as, as shown here. We actually uh, have, I say we because NGS is part of NOAA, um, co-ops, which is the continuous, uh, excuse me, Center for Operational uh, Observation <laughs> Products and Services. <laughs> Products and Services, thank you. Um, are a sister agency of ours. And the water level data uh, that we collect are uh, processed, observed, checked for outliers, um, cleaned, um, and uh, tidal datums are, are computed from uh, the data that are uh, recorded at these tide gauges. I threw this in just because I hadn't seen it before, so it was a learning experience for me as well. Um, that there's a two hour rule that adjacent high and low waters must be different by two hours or more to be counted as a tide. And a tenth of a foot rule or three centimeter rule, adjacent high and low waters must be different in elevation by a tenth of a foot or three centimeters to be counted as a tide. So I hadn't known that before I started trying to do research for this workshop and I just wanted to document this somewhere so I could go back and, and uh, review on that. So I think um, there's been some confusion at least among people that, that don't work with tides about um, 
about different tidal datums. And one of them is station datum. So station datum is a fixed reference datum, unlike the other tidal datums. And it is established at a lower elevation than the water is expected to reach. Now, I have seen actually a mean lower low water datum actually being a negative number relative to station datum. So, but most of the time, you will not see any of the datums having a negative value relative to station datum. And it is important because it does tell you how uh, or help you compute the differences between tidal epochs. But uh, these, these tidal datums are computed on an 18.6 year period, a tidal epoch, a national tidal datum epoch. Um, and our means, generally our means um, of the water levels that are observed. Uh, mean sea level is what we consider the most accurate because it is a mean of each hourly rate over that period. The other means are means of high or low water, but not of the hourly values. And that's why mean sea level or local mean sea level is uh, considered uh, the most accurate um, because it includes, if you will, all the data or the hourly data um, to come up with that computation. I've used the word epic previously. Um, and just to make clear that this epic is not the same as a geodetic epic. A tidal epic is a 19-year period that includes uh, or, it or represents the longest period that are uh, um, produced by the astronomic forces. It does average out the seasonal and meteorological forces that impact things such as El Nino or La Niña's. <coughs> And it provides a consistent tidal datum for any tide gauge uh, in the system, the National Water Level Observation Network. Um, and so it's a way to um, have a consistent basis for your tidal datums. Uh, this, is, this is the page that shows uh, your station information. And I wanted to, uh, as I said, this is a learning experience for me. So. Um, one of the things that I found that was confusing uh, are these dates. I learned that these dates don't mean what they look like. It looks like the station was established in 1974 and it was operating continuously until April 5, 2005. That's not the case. It just represents the date that some equipment was initially established and the date that some equipment was removed. But it does not mean that the station was in operation for that entire duration. Um, so I did uh, want to point out the epic datum comparison. Just uh, so you, if you're looking at historical data as well as current data, you would need to know what the difference is be in heights between those different uh, uh, tidal epic datums. I wanted to spend a little bit of time um, on station datum because I actually had a question come in that uh, showed me um, how things can be confused and, and lead to repercussions. A station datum is fixed and used to calculate the, those different heights. In, for, from co-op's perspective, mean low or low water by definition is usually or always the reference tidal datum for each tidal epoch. When, uh, okay, so, and that's, uh, again, the, the basis for computing or showing the tidal datums is relative to station datum, and it's accessed by clicking on this datum sheet. But I had somebody uh, mistake um, what this really meant. See how NEVD88 is blank? They had assumed that this meant zero and that these datums or the each title datum was referenced to any VD88. So I just want to make the point that blank does not equal zero. In case that ever comes up with people that you work with, that this can be a source of 
of misinterpretation. So um, just a quick graphic that, that gives an illustration of the tidal datums, not geodetic datums. Um, and then what's not shown is that station datum generally is down here, of course, hopefully below the lowest observed or, or mean low or low water. Um, let's see. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on showing you a way to um, get that kind of a graphic view of uh, tidal datums. There's a tool we have on NGS's website um, that will draw that picture for you graphically. Ann and I were talking earlier about how we just have to draw things out. We can't do tidal datums in our head. It has to be a visual representation. Um, and she corrected me just before. You can't imagine the slide I had to remove <laughs> just before I started this presentation. But here on NGS's pages, there is a tool called Tidal and Orthometric Elevations. And if we have the data, we will produce a, a graphic for you that shows that. So I put in um, a lat long and I said, show me all the benchmarks in this area um, that have uh, such a representation. And this is the list of those that don't have the information and below is the list of those that do. And I just picked one randomly and this is what came up. So you can get a graphic representation. Um, it does include, if, it, if we have it, NGVD29 and NEVD88. And what I think is really cool is that it shows both feet and meters in one place. And I think this is about the only place that I've actually seen both units uh, provided for you simultaneously. It does tell you on this page what the primary benchmark is uh, for the tide gauge. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say this is the primary benchmark, but it turns out this is the primary benchmark um, for this tide gauge. But do we know if this represents the primary mark? No, we don't actually, because all we know is the NGS PID for this mark. So I looked up, went back to NGS's um, data sheet site and looked up what this PID was to find out what its designation is. And it turns out that it is 3450N title, which happens to be the same one. So it was coincidence that I happened to pick the title station, um, excuse me, the primary benchmark for this time gauge. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that and you can get that uh, graphical visual representation of the different uh, tidal and geodetic datums. And it does, by the way, also show the epic date, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the tidal epic there. Um, any questions at this point? Okay. I think there's one question. Yeah, I was just going to make a comment. Uh, I think most people realize this, but the primary tide gauge that the tidal datums are based on can greatly affect the tidal datums for that gauge. So it's another factor in addition to which benchmark is the primary benchmark. I'm sorry, you're, I didn't quite hear you. The primary benchmark, the choice of the primary benchmark? No, I was just making a statement that um, in addition to the primary benchmark being important, the uh, primary tide gauge is often oh. an important consideration. We've seen um, quite different datums depending on if the Presidio or Alameda uh, tide gauges were used as the, the reference, reference or the primary yeah, gauge. Yeah, the reference and gauge. likewise with Redwood City. Thanks. Yes. So question, comment? So I have a question on the last slide. Uh, I see it's referenced NAVD 88 is minus point one four feet. H how are you supposed to interpret that? Is that saying that you subtract minus 1.4 feet from all those other values to get the NAVD height? Or, it or is that it, it's, already, it's already factored in? It's saying the datum, the NAVD 88 datum is minus 0.14 feet below mean lower oh, okay. low water datum. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. All right, thanks. It's an excellent question because no matter how many times I use, I have to think because I think the confusion stems from the fact that we show datums, but when we work, we're actually working with points and elevations. 
or a point's elevation is sort of the opposite sign of the datum difference. So, in, <laughs> in this case, the da this is showing the datums relative to each other, not a point's elevation reference to any one datum. So if you were to convert one to the other, you would actually do the opposite of what it appears for to look like on here. For a point. Oh. So I was just saying, based on this graphic, you kind of do the opposite of what it looks like on the this um, depictive staff here, where if you want to go from mean lower low water to NABD, instead of subtracting, you would add. So for a point's elevation. Right, for yeah. a datum, a data reference to a datum. Yes, for data, yes. Yeah. <laughs> A, f a few slides back, um, you, you have a title datums page. Uh, and you said when NAVD88 was equal or was blank, that, that didn't equal zero. So then what does that mean? It means we don't have NAVD88 determined. And, and that's because it wasn't um, leveled at an accuracy that was acceptable to be posted? Yes. Yeah. It, the, the need to relate geodetic vertical datum to tide gauge was not crucial till at least any VD88 came out. So this happens to be, a, if, I, if I could say, a historical tide gauge. It's not a current, i.e. primary tide gauge. So m I'd say most in California, most of the non-primary tide gauges do not have any VD80 computed and therein lies the problem. Many did not have NGVD29. Yeah, most of these don't still exist. I mean, there's yeah. probably, there's only one or two active tide gauges in any one area and all of these other ones that are up there are ones that were installed just for That's a few sometime. months to do a survey or something like that. So in 1982, you know, they might not have thought about what NAVD88 was going to be. So they right. can't compute it unless there's some other benchmark you can tie it into. Or f you're right, and that's so a good point. For the purposes of whatever, why ever it was installed, maybe it was because they were doing a bathymetric survey of the area and they wanted tidally controlled um, observations. Yeah, and so that's true all up and down, the er everywhere, really. I mean, the, there's only a few, and that's why there's always a primary uh, tide gauge that's got 19 years worth of data at least because these might have only been there for 90 days and then to get all the harmonics for the lower order periods they just refer it back to some more historic tide gauge one that's been there for years historic but current <laughs> yeah long term long term yeah I just want to say real quickly um, NOAA co-ops that runs and has done the traditional, historic, and existing tide stations until the last few years didn't really care about geodetic at all. It wasn't, their interest was how, especially if you look at navigation, how does the land, where is it relative to a water level? So their focus was very much water. And so whether that land goes up or down relative to a place in New York City, nobody cared here in San Francisco. It was, where is it today relative to the channels we dredge or where we take a boat or what have you. So it's only in the last several years that there's been sort of a cross-pollination between NGS and co-ops and other groups, FEMA, that have finally realized there's a need to tie this all together. And so, it is now a requirement with new tide stations. And we've tied the Dumbarton and Coyote station into NAVD88. And um, co-ops is allowing us to do that by using OpusDB instead of providing um, blue booking or some other you know, more complicated, expensive way of doing it. So that is now something they do but historically it wasn't. And so a lot of, you have to be careful with tr the historic stations, not only because they didn't do it, but sometimes they give you an elevation, but it's based on VertCon. 
which isn't reliable necessarily. You have to look at time, place, you know. So even these charts that give you these nice bar graphs, you have to be cautious and go look at where that data is coming from. I'm not that familiar with Opus. I'm, I'm not that familiar with Opus. Is that sort of uh, an open source database to some degree where if it's data meets certain NGS levels? It's NGS software. It's available on our, on our website. It's a, it's a program where you can submit your data anywhere from 15 minutes, has to be dual frequency, 15 minutes of data up to almost two days. Um, and it will be processed relative to our continuously operating reference stations and provide you back results. And so as Anne was saying, co-ops is starting to utilize it. As we improve the geoid model more and more, they're starting to utilize that um, in their work to get some kind of tie with the geodetic datum, vertical datum. Um, I skipped through some of the sea level rise stuff. Um, I just did want to say that there are trends that are available on co-op's uh, web page. Um, you can do it by state, and then you can look at uh, the data for a particular station if you're interested in. Um, and of course, as I had mentioned earlier, you have to take into account the differences in tidal epochs when you're doing uh, such long-term trends. Um, but we talked about, um, briefly, um, and I probably should have gone into more detail, these are the stations you can get those for, um, about what data are available on, on co-op's website and the differences between the primary, which are current, actively operating, and, and uh, not, which are secondary and tertiary. So if you choose up here tide predictions, um, you can, and zoom in far enough, um, you can, the other, uh, non-primary stations will come up. Primary in this case means that they have at least 19 years of data. It does not mean that they are necessarily current. That you can tell by looking over here. So Dumbarton, not uh, counting the current uh, tide gauge installation, from NOAA's perspective, Dumbarton is not an, an active tide gauge, but it is a primary tide gauge because it has at least 19 years of data to make it a, a primary. So. Uh, I've lost the mouse. Okay, so the red will indicate that it is current. These, the red here um, indicates that, that it's a current tide gauge. So uh, you can zoom in and check the amount of data that was collected at any of these stations. Um, I, well, if you if you uh, click on that, um, and and Anne made a good point when we were talking about this as I was preparing. These data go into vDatum, which I'll get into momentarily, our software that allows you to convert between tidal and geodetic vertical datums, which is a model. So it's good to know the nature and the quality of the data that went into that model, and you can get a sense of how much or how little data went in from the tide gauges to the model in a particular location. Um, sorry. So going back to the, the dates and the amount of data that was collected, it implies, <laughs> to me anyway, um, and then co-ops wrote back and go, yeah, we you know, that's one of the things that we really ought to change. Um, but it was not collected for this amount of period. You can find that if you pull up the benchmarks sheet, what the actual um, period of data was for any one of these stations, and in this case, the uh, time period was for 12 months from April of, and when it was, April of 1984 to March of 1985. So that's where you would find how much data went into this, this station. So um, a station of a year or more, but less than 19, is a secondary. And any station that has less than a year of data is a tertiary. So it can be, I think, a, a month, I think, is the minimum. 30 days is the minimum, one cycle of the moon um, is the minimum um, that we have tried to uh, compute tidal datums for. Um, and then of course um, it does give you the tidal, tidal epoch as well. 
So I thought that was pretty helpful to, um, to be able to ascertain um, how much uh, data was available. And um, you can also take a look at um, all the title uh, predictions and which ones have are primary. They're called harmonic in this table. Um, the primary tie gauge is called harmonic and then the secondaries are subordinate because they are referenced to a primary tie gauge to compute the um, the offset in time and, and height uh, of the tide where you are if you're not at a primary tide gauge. So V datum, uh, I wanted to spend some time. Um, Anne would probably say I don't need to spend any time because <laughs> she doesn't think that V datum is co uh, accurate enough. But um, if you want to get a sense anyway of the datums, um, then this is a pretty handy way to at least get a sense of the, of the uh, where, you know, relatively where an ellipsoid height is, a geodetic height, and a tidal height, a tidal datum. But there are a number of errors, um, and, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details, but you should uh, know about all the things that, uh, that go into them. Um, you can download it from, from co-op's website or from ours. From ours, it's here under tools, vertical conversions, v-datum. And this is the main page. You can download it now. You will need to click the box that says you read this estimate of vertical uncertainties, and I urge you to do that because it uh, is really uh, important and well written. Here's the number of uh, different datums that, that are available. The ellipsoid datums, the, the reference ellipsoid datums, the orth, orth, excuse me, orthometric datums, and the various tidal datums that, that are av available. This is a, an example of the amount of error, which is additive, that can be associated with those results. And it's significant. Um, I'll show you a, a total uh, in a little bit. But let's say you're starting from an NED83 ellipsoid height. You need to transform to NEVD88. The transformation error is plus or minus five centimeters. The error in the data itself is two centimeters. The error in the data for NEVD88 is five centimeters. So all these things are additive, and there's a table associated with these that shows you the maxim, maximum cumulative uncertainty associated with each of these data sets. I've uh, included just the four data sets that pertain to California. If we focus in on the San Francisco Bay, it's basically 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters of error. So it's not small. Um, you know, again, I don't know if you'd want to rely, I'd say you wouldn't, on V datum as a way to define what those vertical datums are in your area. But it does give you, as I said, a generalized sense of at least the relationship between the various vertical datums. Um, from, at least from the data that went into the model, as I was saying earlier. However, um, wanted to uh, be aware that there was uh, data collected in 2005. Um, Amy can maybe speak to more about that, but um, USGS was instrumental in establishing some tie gauges to uh, help control a bathymetric survey um, and uh, worked with NOAA's co-op's office to come up with the tidal datums that were computed at that time for that data collection effort. So there were, uh, these four tide stations were established temporarily um, at that time to, to aid in that uh, effort to, uh, for the bathymetric survey. And USGS has an open file report yes. about that. And so I don't think I put that on here, but you probably know about that or know more than I do about that. And uh, one of the authors is here <laughs> to, to speak. So. Um, the zone, tidal zonation, zonation scheme is illustrated here, um, showing the uh, delay in, uh, in, or the heights, difference in heights 
in these regions um, based on the tide gauges that were established um, for this for this effort, showing um, NAD, excuse me, NAVD88 relative to mean lower low water, and zooming in closer. Um, oh, let's see, I wanted to. Oh, I guess that's what I want to do. Wanted to. All right, let's go this way then. Um, I think this is at Dumbarton, and V datum shows a difference between those two datums as minus 0.7 feet. I did it in feet. I changed. I'm not sure why the mouse is doing that because I'm not touching any of the keys. <laughs> but uh, I'll try to go back. Um, so it's minus 0.7 feet. And if you look there, it's 1.2 feet. So V datum is showing something that differs from the more recent data by about half a foot. That's an example, I think, of um, why you should not rely on V datum for your work in this area. Um, See if I can get through. Okay. Now the mouse is act. Okay. Oh, and that was the point conversion thing I was talking about earlier. Um, the difference between thinking about things in terms of datums and then thinking about things in terms of an elevation of a point. And then zooming in to uh, this area more specifically. These are the differences between the two datums that were computed for, for this area. And in that report, um, as an appendix, I think, to, to the report, co-ops had come up with this um, zonation scheme. Note that there were some locations where uh, we couldn't record low water, so it's a high water only um, datum that was computed for those areas. Okay, I did include a graphic. So, tie gauge is with, around here. Is that right and up to the river. Okay. Yeah. So, oh wait. Well, I just did some calculations. I just took some random, sort of random, but identifiable places. I said, okay, what's the um, using V data? And what's the difference um, here at that point? Oops, sorry. And I came up with, again, in feet, so eight tenths of a foot. And then I went uh, further or closer to where that tide gauge location was, 0.57 feet. And then I had a, a perfect example of a real world <laughs> example. I got this minus 999, made an error. So just to let you know, when you get that, that means that the model does not include that geographically. It's you're out of range geographically. Or you fat fingered a boo boo and you typed it in wrong. <laughs> Didn't include a space if you're using degrees, minutes, seconds um, in the format. So, any comment? Somebody? Okay. Um, so, as, as Ann mentioned at the beginning, um, there were two tide gauges installed this year to collect data to try to come up with a better determination of tidal datums, particularly for the low water phases, which were difficult to or impossible to get earlier. And, well, the goal was to get three continuous months of data at Dumbarton and, and mention that we're a month shy of that or so now. And that would be considered a tertiary station because it's less than a year. And then a year's worth of data at the uh, Coyote Creek Elviso Slough location. <coughs> and we're along the way there as well. Uh, a little long, take a little longer than we thought. But um, that wraps up what I wanted to uh, cover in this workshop. And I um, hope that that's been helpful to you to, to figure out at least um, both from a geodetic vertical datum perspective and a tie gauge perspective. 
Are there any other questions or comments? Amy? I'm going to make one quick statement um, just to avoid any confusion. The gauges we have out at Dumbarton and Coyote, they're being handled not by NOAA co-ops directly. So the way it's handled is we collect, once we get three full months of data, we submit that to co-ops. They will validate it and then it will get published to their website and it will be available. But we'll make that data available before it even goes to co-ops so that people have access to it. Um, but just, I know we talked a lot about, oh, that's an, a historic site and, you know, Dumbarton is an active station, but it's not co-ops, it's active station. So we make periodic submittals. We're not giving, sending them data by a satellite, which is their typical setup. Um, so just to clarify that for everyone. Thanks. I should have made and that clear. And as a, yeah. a follow-up to that, I just want to say before we get to questions, um, can you hear me? No? Am I off? Am I on? Um, in light of that, um, like I mentioned earlier, Fish and Wildlife Services paid for the installation of those two gauges, but um, the ongoing operation and maintenance of that um, gauge, especially the Coyote Albiso gauge, is um, uncertain at this point. And what we would like to do is um, have uh, NOAA put that Coyote Albiso gauge in as part of their national water level is that right? L and yeah. and L one um, stations. Um, and to that end, uh, the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project is writing a letter, has drafted a letter to NOAA to request that. And we would like your help in if you use that data, if you feel that tidal station is important to have ongoing, um, if you could write letters of support um, that we would include with our letter to NOAA. Um, to support them taking over that station, that would be great. So I'll be sending out an email um, I have everybody's address, either through Eventbrite or on that signature, and I'll send you out this, the sample letter. And then if you could um, do that within the next, you know, month or so, that would be great. And if you know others that are using the data and would also write, write a letter of support, please forward the email that I will send you. And I'm gathering all the letters. We'll put it all together as an attachment to NOAA, and then the project will submit our request to NOAA. So we would like your help in that. With that, I'll open it back up to questions. Um, I had a couple questions. First, um, I wanted to point out that when I was going back and forth with a bunch of people about why the V datum conversions are um, so poor in South Bay, I guess, as you pointed out on that benchmark seat, the NAVD elevations aren't collected at um, Dumbarton. So they didn't use that in their VDATUM tool. And so it's um, the NAVD to mean lower the water conversion is always underestimated south of Dumbarton. And as uh, Marty pointed out, it gets worse when you get towards the island ponds, which is of course where we care about, where it's at least like 30 centimeters. Um, so I encourage you to go to that open file report and use the conversions that we put together for that 2005 bathmetric mm -hmm. survey that Steve did because you'll be better off. Um, that's the best information we have to go out at the time. Um, and also Marty showed that there weren't conversions for the far ends of the slough um, because the NOAA acoustic tide gauge in Coyote Creek had failed, but Steve was able to put some pressure sensors um, in those sloughs. So we also have um, interpolated values for those conversions there. So it's all in that open file report. Um, and I guess I wasn't quite clear then, so is the information from these gauges, is there a possibility of that ever being used to improve VDATUM? And is there anything we can do to either get them to somewhere put that there's this large error? Like in the, you know, when you look at the disclaimer, it says it could be up to 10 centimeters, but in reality in this area, it's up to 30, 30 plus centimeters. So yeah. um, I'm not sure if there's somewhere we can get that word out. Uh, is there, um, it would be my goal. and. Are we still being taped? No. <laughs> okay. And I would say, I would say that we've, we've had this conversation with co-ops personnel several times. Um, yes, I was disheartened to see that, in fact, there isn't anything specific about, say, the 2005 work. You know, that's findable on NOAA's website. You know, it's kind of like you have to know to know. And I think that's a shame. And that's partly why we're trying to 
you know, educate people about this, but you already have to know to know. So I will make it a point to inquire about trying to get some asterisk or something somewhere um, to do that. But having said that, I looked at our website, because that's, of course, where people would go to look. And I don't know how we could do it, but I did actually suggest in the lower right corner, you have a blank box, you could put special studies. That was a suggestion I made last week when I was trying to do this research. So I will bring it up the line to see what can be done to direct people elsewhere to get more up-to-date data. I really appreciate that you all are uh, doing this and, and also uh, getting the pages installed. As a professional engineer um, practicing in the Bay Area for quite a while and also at the Puget Sound, I've noticed that quite a few practitioners are Oh, Mike, your mic is not on. Can you hear me now? Is that okay? I've noticed that quite a few practitioners are um, skipping the step of hiring a, a licensed surveyor or uh, using uh, VData. Um, and uh, I don't know who's responsible for getting the word out, but I think it would be very important for someone to um, acknowledge more specifically that VData does have some limitations in some areas. Uh, it's, it was real interesting to me recently how many uh, people uh, treat it as accurate Gospel. without question. And mm -hmm. um, I, it's good that we're all aware of this here, but I can tell you that a lot of people aren't. And they're uh, using it for survey control for um, uh, construction projects and the like. Yes, which yeah. I would not recommend. And, and that is a, a crucial point to make. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, we we're talking in, in the car on the way here um, that my perspective is that there are millions of dollars being spent on restoration efforts. And it would behoove people to spend a few thousand, few tens of thousands of dollars to get professional people trying to determine your elevations for you because it is, it is not a trivial task. It is extremely daunting to try to get accurate elevations. It is, it is not for the faint of heart. Um, and I think that's a good point to make that uh, even, even professional land surveyors with, with high quality equipment and all the correct um, excruciatingly detailed techniques that we have to do can still get results that have to be thrown out. It is, it is not a simple or trivial task to try to get elevations. Um, certainly leveling is accurate, um, but uh, you'd have to do geodetic quality leveling, which I didn't even get into. Um, with all the proper equipment, temperatures taken at the top and bottom of the tripod for every measurement you take, every measurement. And that all has to go into that kind of uh, orthometric corrections, temperature corrections that are done for geodetic leveling. So there are a number of options, but it does require some um, detailed in the, in, uh, I'd say, I guess, uh, a lot of expertise to get at elevations that you can rely on. The datum is a tool, and it, it is just a tool. Like the geoid model is a tool. We're trying to improve both, for example, but um, it is not something that is to be relied, it's like VertCon. VertCon was a model and uh, we don't recommend, it says there on somewhere on our website, we don't recommend use of VertCon for, for uh, as geodetic control. It was a tool and it's good for mapping purposes, I think it says. But uh, I do want to make that point. Thank you for bringing it up. There's a question in the back. Marty, <coughs> is this working? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can hear you through. Uh, can you say a few words about the phasing out of N NAVD 88 and why it's changing? A Again? few? <laughs> Let's see, it's 310. <laughs> <laughs> I can, since you brought it up. I'd rather not. <laughs> As you have pointed out, NGS is gearing up to phase out NAVD 88 in about 10 years' time. So there are a number of young people in here 
that will, if you stay in this profession, need to deal with that. Why is because we are going to rely, I guess, if you will, strictly on GPS data to define the vertical datum. Thus far, of course, we've relied on leveling data to define the vertical datum. That's gone the way of the dinosaurs. We're not doing that anymore. We will never level again across the country. So because we're relying on, on our uh, GPS data to define the vertical datum, we're going to change the entire way we uh, define both, in fact, the horizontal and the vertical datum. The horizontal will become geometric, the 3D that it is, it will be earth-centered, earth-fixed, and then the vertical datum, which we're going to call the geopotential or some name like that, um, because it will be relying on gravity data as modeled both by satellite and then airborne gravity, which we're flying right now. It's a 10-year project. Redefining both the geometric and the geopotential datums. Our goal is about 2022 and it's based on completing the airborne gravity surveys that we're doing across the country and, and in areas that we have responsibility. Does that answer your question? Okay, so, so yes, news to come. There will be yet another vertical datum to consider, and that's why, again, definitely document what vertical datum it is you are utilizing now. I was wondering if you could talk again, it's not kind of in a similar way, about uh, CORS 96 and NSRS 2007 and what the differences are and because I have uh, Helmert transformations from WGS 84 to CORS 96 that were published by you know, Solar and SNE or something like that. I've never seen anything for 2007. So I'm just curious if we're doing it right or what we're supposed to be doing to convert from uh, WGS 84 to NAD 83 2007 or NSRS 2007. Okay. NSRS 2007 is based on CORS 96. It is the passive realization of our geodetic control. I mean, it's based on the observations on passive monuments. So we started from the ITRF system transform to NED83. The CORS 96 is the reference frame for the continuously operating reference stations and then transformed to NED83. Which transformations are on our web page? Did you find the, uh, that? HTTP uh, software, which you know, we've, revert, we've got that code and we're using that. To the HTTP software to convert from uh, this, that's the horizontal time-dependent right. positioning yes. for uh, going from ITRF to NAND 83 cores 96. And those equations were published uh, a few years ago by Solar and SNE. But I was just curious if we should be doing, those have the velocities in there. I was curious if we should be doing something different for uh, NSRS 2007. No, we're starting to see yeah. benchmarks. I think you're there. doing it right because NSRS 2007 is based ultimately on cores 96, NED 83 cores 96. Any other questions? Yes. I have a quick question relating to the station datums. Uh, for the example you gave for Dumbarton, the official published station datum was a little bit different than the datum from Opus that was presumably is from the data when the core installed their observations. If you were going to use that data from the core, would you prioritize the official station datum or, or the, the OPUS data from when they installed that station? I realize they're both within the error bars. Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, I'm sure I don't understand your oh. question. So <laughs> if, if one were to but use data from, from Dumbarton, would you, would you use well, it relative sta to the station data or data datum? from the tie gauge? Yes. Okay. So the station datum that's on the published benchmark sheet is slightly different than the station datum from the I'll OPUS data that, that She's the Army Corps. So I, I mainly I was just trying to understand with that new data how that, that was being used. When we, when we distribute the data, we will give you a conversion to NAVD88. In fact, actually, take that back. The way I intended to distribute it was to distribute it in NAVD88 
station datum doesn't mean a lot to most people and I figured it would just cause more confusion. Um, we can make the data available in any reference mm -hmm. or format somebody wants, but the intent, we resurveyed, we did more than, we did leveling of all the benchmarks when we put the stations in um, and they'll be done again when we take them out, but um, so we have accurate NAV to 88 elevations. We'll give you that conversion with this data. Um, the core, the Opus DB is just what is submitted th as a GPS um, because NOAA co-ops wants to make sure that we get into the NGS system. And if we were to submit and get into the NGS system with just the leveling, we'd have to go through the entire blue booking process, which no one really wants to pay for and it's kind of cumbersome. So the Opus DB gives us that way of doing that but we have leveled elevations as well as the Opus DB. So we'll give you that conversion based on all of the survey work that was done when that station was put in. Which would include station datum. Yeah. If you want. Yeah, we'll have, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm, I, I'll try to make this brief, but I just want to tie and make it one more level of difficulty. Uh, several people in here are interested in the tidal datums because they relate to uh, the, the zonation of, of habitats and tidal marshes and that's what all the restoration is about. And um, I was just wondering first if you could say these stations that are going in, some of them are for only three months. Obviously they're not primary stations. Is there some sort of accuracy plus or minus the, the error bars on the tidal datums that you're going to get from these short duration stations? And then how does that relate to the accuracy you would get from an RTK survey of the, the station, the, of the, the habitats themselves? And the reason why I ask that is because you, you may get tidal datums at the station, but as you go up the sloughs and deeper into the marshes themselves, all of that kind of goes out the window because the depth and duration of flooding changes with tidal geometry. Can I comment first? Please. Um, when we started the shoreline project, the South San Francisco Bay shoreline study, um, we convened a group of um, key players from all of the agencies, NGS, NOAA co-ops. Um, the recommendation that came out of those meetings was that we needed five tide gauges minimum to characterize the study area. Um, Dumbarton was one, Coyote Creek, Alvisa Slough was picked as the most important because it most it best represented the entire South Bay, south of Dumbarton. Um, but the other three stations that were recommended are north of the island ponds on Coyote Creek, or upstream of the ponds on Coyote Creek, um, Gold Street Bridge on Alviso Slough, and then upstream on Guadalupe Slough, because those are the three biggest channels in the area and have the most influence. Um, so at this point right now, where we're at is we only have the two stations. So we still do not have all the information we would need to really characterize how the tidal prism is changing as you go into the sloughs and up into the pond areas. And so if, if there's some precision, because I mean lots of times when you're talking about surveys, especially licensed surveyors, they're interested in plus or minus a centimeter. I don't know if that's really important. I don't think it's really important for the plants, for the marsh habitats. Certainly it's decimeters, but um, could you get that kind of accuracy from an RTK survey? You could. I think it can be important to plants actually. Um, some plants, the amount of and frequency of inundation can be crucial. Um, you can, and, and I should say, you know, we say RTK doesn't really need to be real time. The the point is kinematic methods, which are basically short. That's really what we're saying, very short observations, seconds or minutes, as opposed to, you know, near an hour. You can get accuracy, but the chances of you're not getting that accuracy are much greater. So my bottom line is always do redundant measurements. You have no way of knowing if you're accurate, accurate, unless you take multiple measurements um, and check that against something that is known, if you will. But, and I think it is important to do it, again, at a different time of day. So you get a different 
um, you know, solution from different, if you will, base stations, base stations being the different satellites. So I think that's important. We have some additional yeah. comments. I'm just curious. One idea that was we had it early on was that we establish a network of of primary benchmarks so that if someone was going out into the field to do measurements for biology or what have you, they could go take their own instrument, go to that benchmark and see how they compared and use that as a way to correct. Does that make sense? Is that a viable? Yeah. I mean, we don't have that network in place, but is that a way of looking at that is. finding and, a solution? And there are some of the, I mean, my map showed some of the um, existing geodetic control that has um, height mod heights on it. So that is one way to do that as well. And I don't know if that would meet, you know, your sense of, you know, key stations, but that's an option. Some of them are, you know, hard to ac access, like on Moffett Field. Um, it's secure, <laughs> so you pretty much can't, almost not even if you're federal, but the others are in the vicinity are accessible. I have a question for Steve and Anne. What about the benchmarks that were established for the two tide gauges, are those possible for researchers to use to do what you suggested in terms of establishing? Um, the benchmarks that were established, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, but for Coyote Creek gauge, um, they're pretty hard to get to. Mm -hmm. They're on the pg e towers or they're mm -hmm. on, especially with the flooding of A6, it's made some of them inaccessible without a lot of effort and work, and it depends on the tide whether you can get to them or not. Um, the Dumbarton, yes, but the, the, the value of those marks is only good within a certain small area of those marks. You can't use, say, the mark at Dumbarton to say whether or not the island ponds are, yeah. So those of you know, that don't know me, I'm with uh, ESA PWA, formerly Philip Williams and Associates. So. On all of our South Bay salt ponds work, we hire a towel. Um, I think it was towel pretty much every time. Um, and also the Napa salt ponds uh, to establish two benchmarks per pond that we worked on. And I don't know exactly their accuracy, but I think they're plenty accurate enough for um, construction control um, and probably also hydrodynamic and, you know, kind of geomorphic analysis. and. So every salt pond that has any um, work done on it, it has um, at least one, probably two benchmarks on it. So and you can where, uh, contact where can those. That, can those be made somewhere? available? I mean, are those? Yeah, they're um, they're on our. Uh, I can get them to you, or the towel can. You know, we have all the X, Y, Zs on those. Now, I would say that over time they may subside, and, and there's been construction sure. and the like, but. Uh, um, that's our standard practice when we uh, start working on a project is to have a licensed surveyor set up uh, two line of sight benchmarks um, for subsequent work. I think it would be useful if, if the project could post that or a link to that on, the, on our website. If you could um, send that to me and then I'll post it on the website and I'll also send an email out to everybody who's attending this seminar. Okay. And, and the key to that is having them, peri you know, every so many years getting them updated or, or if there's been work to maintain the levees, sometimes they get buried or lost. Um, the, the, Marty and I have had this discussion many times about whether two or three or, you know, we tend to say put them out in clusters of three just because then if two don't agree, if one doesn't agree, hopefully you still have two that do. Um, but that's, you know, every project's different on what they need. The moment's kind of passed, but I was just going to go back to your question about how well do we know the, the actual inundation curves uh, from a short tide gauge, you know, either because it's not close enough to the area you're studying or because the, the record's not long enough to have captured all the seasonal cycles that we're going to go through in the next 19 years or whatever. But uh, NOAA has some good publications of historical studies where they have done that, where they take a 19-year tide record and they shorten it up and they show like what does a secondary station actually tell you in one of the error bars on the different tidal datums. And it's, it's actually interesting reading for a biologist because it's, it shows you kind of for, a, you know, there might be something unique about the three months we have this station out this, this summer versus say five years from now and things will look different. And a long-term tide gauge would be able to capture all that but this short one doesn't and they that, that paper, and I forget now, you guys have redone your website where, where to get it, but 
there's some pretty good information from NOAA about, okay, your, your station is only 90 days long. Here's the air bars on the mean lower low water on the west coast, right. for example. Yeah, I have seen that somewhere too. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's good reading uh, for, from a biologist because I know exactly what you're trying to get at. It's like how, how wet is my plant or how long is it going to get sunlight mm -hmm. or be exposed. And if you can send me that reference, I can... If you just send me the uh, reference, I will circulate it to people on the e email list. More questions? I think we're... We're being... Yeah. So, last... Last question. Okay, so <clears throat> this is actually a little bit more of a, a general question and ask more as a, a citizen than I guess as a scientist. But uh, the question is, we've been talking about um, elevation of tides as it relates to a restoration project, but another concern is flood risk in, in the surrounding areas. Um, are we collecting the data that we need to accurately predict that? Um, you said that for this South San Francisco Bay shoreline study that five, tie, five gauges was recommended. And I wonder, is that recommended for South Bay salt pond studies or is that also recommended for, for flood risk? I think that this... Uh, Wait, microphone. Sorry. The San Francisco Bay shoreline study had two, two well, multiple missions, but two were flood control and restoration. So the recommendation was for both of those. And uh, it seems like the funding for that should just be there. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a good note to end on? Yeah. No comment? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I want to, uh, we're being asked to leave because there's yeah. another group coming in. So I want to thank you again all for your participation and your great questions. If you're on the webinar and you have not signed up via web, uh, Eventbrite, if you could email me if you're interested in being um, on further emails on this topic, that would be great. And again, thank you all. Thank and you. thank you to Marty. <laughs> thank you. And Ann. <laughs> Thanks. See you again. Yeah, 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 we met.